another amazing summer day in the woods. <laughs> Let's jump in. I'm going to do the last section on the Peace Pilgrim. The description of this video, I'm going to put a link to a lecture by the Peace Pilgrim that she gave to a uh, college class, college philosophy class some years ago. I've listened to it this morning. I'm going to listen to it again this afternoon and take some notes. And I'll share with you uh, some of the things I'm going to do. I, I think up for a few days in a row, I'm going to keep an hourly journal. Uh, you know, I'm a monk, so I have that kind of time to do it. But maybe if you want to do it like twice a day or something, to ask myself, um, has the last hour been focused on service to humanity at all? Has, have I been focused on my higher self? And just kind of as a reminder, not really to keep a record, but kind of as a reminder to keep putting my mind back in that healthy mind space that she's talking about, uh, doing some practical work. And practical stuff is different for everybody. So, you know, we all have to come up with our own ways of, uh, of growing, doing this inward development. So the last section, she talks about her four relinquishments. Uh, these are the four renunciations, <laughs> which is a very unpopular word in the world. The first one is this relinquishment of self-will. I'm surprised that she put this here uh, for no real reason other than this is such a central tenet to Vedantic ideals. Now, uh, this relinquishment of self-will, it's, you know, you have a nature inside and the sages say that that nature is Satchitananda. We've talked about that frequently, that existence, that intelligence and that love absolute. And that our goal is to let this manifest but normally we identify with the mind and body part of us and not with that soul part of us. And the mind is just a reflection. The body is just a reflection of the soul in there. But by identifying with the body, we identify a lower self that's interested in selfish things because it's identified as a small singular perspective that, that is always in the minority when looking at the other, this huge outside world. And she says you have as, or it's as though you have, and very important point, because you don't actually have a higher self and a lower self. You have only a higher self, and then you have an idea of a lower self that happens when you mix the identification of soul with body and mind. That's called the ego. That's this lower self that wants things for the body and wants things for the mind. She says it seems that you have two selves, the lower self that governs you selfishly and the higher self which stands ready to use you gloriously. You must subordinate the lower self by refraining from doing the not good things that you are motivated toward, not suppressing them, but transforming them so that the higher self can take over your life. And that's important, not, not repression. You know, pushing down these things doesn't happen. What it does is give you what I call a spiritual hernia, which means it, it, it will manifest, but in weird ways. <laughs> you know, your sexuality will start expressing in bizarre ways. Uh, you know, as, as an example. But to turn them to higher things through, through discrimination or discernment. Discernment's a better word because in our culture, discrimination means something very different nowadays. But discernment, this idea of looking closely, closely at what you're desiring, asking yourself, why do you want it? Has it been successful in giving you long-term satisfaction before? Uh, how long will the pleasure last and how does it leave you feeling uh, in its aftermath? You know, and so to, to look closely at those things and try and turn the mind to those parts of you that have long lasting pleasure, you know, becoming what you want to be and manifesting a world that you want to live in. So the second one, relinquishment of the feeling of separateness. She says, all of us all over the world are cells in the body of humanity. You are not separate from your fellow humans and you cannot find harmony for yourself alone. You can only find harmony when you realize the oneness of all and work for the good of all. That unselfishness, which again belongs to you as your true self, the identity as a soul, as spirit, which is how we find that unity, is by seeing that ideal first in each other, you know, looking into their eyes and seeing that soul, which is that Satchitananda, that existence. That is where our unity lies. All of the particulars, the way that we dress the body, the body that we happen to inhabit, all of those adjunct uh, identities uh, cause the separation and then manifest that selfishness. But by really emphasizing who we are, I am pure love, I am universal, I am infinite, by knowing the nature of the soul, uh, which the sages tell us about after doing all the work, and mind you, you don't have to believe in it necessarily in the beginning. You know, it's not something you're asked to believe. 
It's what the sages have seen after doing lots of work. If you want to see it yourself, then of course there's lots of work to be done. But in the meantime, uh, it's good to come from that non-selfish space to, to serve humanity as a whole and not just ourselves, not to be that small self. Number three, relinquishment of attachments, yes. Only when you have relinquished all attachments can you feel really free. Material things are here for use, and anything you cannot relinquish when it has outlived its usefulness possesses you. You can only live in harmony with your fellow humans if you have no feeling that you possess them, and therefore do not try to run their lives. Good boundaries, healthy boundaries are always a good thing. But this attachment, I could turn a whole hour's lecture into this idea of attachment. What attachment is, is we only ever experience this, this moment, the present moment. And when there's something in the present moment that we don't want to pass, that we don't want to let the changing change, we try and hold on to it. We put it in our mind. We make an impression of it. The taste of pizza, the feeling of great, uh, great uh, sex, the, uh, you know, the, the, the bliss of drunkenness. We grab those things and we put just that in our mind. And what happens is when we experience the present, we remember these attachments and they make the, the present feel like it's not whole. Oh, I wish I had, or oh, I wish I could experience, oh, I wish I was at that place, you know. That was the worst part about coming back from vacation. It was like, oh man, I wish I was still on the beach or still in those mountains. But that's attachment. And when you take something from a past experience and project it on the moment and feel a sense of lack, you're under the compulsion of something unreal. That memory does not exist in the present moment. You are merely using it as a lens to observe a moment that could be perfect if you could see the moment as it is. So let go of all those attachments, this, this idea that you need something external to be content, to be whole, to be full. Really focus on being present. Breathe into your existence. Think for a moment of what it is to be. How amazing, I mean, we don't know the first thing about it. What a wonderful and amazing thing to experience. Just to sit there and breathe and think about the body and how it works and the mind and what it presents and how it operates and all of these amazing things that science hasn't even begun to scratch uh, the, the know-how for it. And to think that it all exists naturally. We have the easiest computer ever, the mind. We didn't have to, <laughs> you know, that no interfacing almost it's just right there for us and a body this amazing this amazing functional equipment that we have that just does what we tell it we don't have to figure out all that stuff you know number four relinquishment of all negative feelings work on relinquishing negative feelings if you live in a present moment which is really the only moment you have to live we just talked about that right you will be less apt to worry if you realize that those who do mean things are psychologically ill, frankly, <laughs> your feelings of anger will turn to feelings of pity. If you recognize that all of your inner hurts are caused by your own wrong actions, or your own wrong reactions, or your own wrong inaction, then you will stop hurting yourself. Again, you come to learn that by paying attention, by, by really coming into the moment and being aware of what's causing you to move. You know, are you coming from a place of pain? Are you coming from uh, a place of arrogance? Are you coming from a place of selfishness? You know, and that's why that idea that I want to work on in the next three, three or four days is to keep a journal throughout the day to make myself uh, aware of where my mind is. What am I looking for in my moments? What am I doing with my time during the day? Am I wasting it with unuseful actions, which is one of the teachings that she gave uh, yesterday or the day before? You know, am I filling it with selfish ideas? Am I thinking about things that are good only for me and maybe not even good for me? But to come into an awareness and to pull ourselves together here. So these four relinquishments are amazing. They really have a wonderful place if you, re, if you go and listen to this lecture that, uh, that I'll put the link in the description for this video today. Anyway, glad to share these things and I hope and really send good energy your ways in improving and becoming really what we are, manifesting that highest ideal.